All right, guys. Welcome to the Wildlife Society meeting for tonight. How's everybody doing? Good. It's almost Thanksgiving. That's good. Um, <laughs> so uh, tonight we'll have our last seminar of the Daniel O. Trainer seminar series, which is celebrating the 50th anniversary of our student chapter. And tonight we have Kurt Burkotteran, who is going to be talking to us about his experiences with TWS and his work. So I think it'll be a really great presentation. Our recordings are available on the CNR's YouTube channel, so you can check out any of those if you miss them and enjoy the presentation. Hi, I'm Jennifer Summers. I'm the Program Development Specialist with the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all, first of all, for being here, and thank you to everybody who is here via Zoom as well. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us virtually or in person. Um, like uh, Brylin said, we have Kurt Verhotter in here tonight. And I wanted to mention uh, that, you know, this seminar series is, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And I'd like to give a, a shout out and thank you to Brylin for um, offering this time period here um, during your usual meeting to have these seminars. I'd also like to thank Scott Hingstrom, who's the director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. And some of you may have him as a professor. Um, and so just like to thank him for all his work on this series as well. And now always go through a couple of acknowledgements. Um, uh, when it sounds pretty good. Just give me one when we're here. Here. Um, so, I'm gonna mute. So, <laughs> so those of you that are on Zoom, please remember to mute your microphones and uh, keep your videos off if you could, please. Um, and so we have this acknowledgement with the local tribes where we recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Menominee and Ho-Chunk people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and the, sorry, to honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. And with that, Scott Hingstrom is gonna come and say a couple words about uh, Daniel O'Trainer and then introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I, it is a pleasure to be here. It's uh, the fourth of our seminar series. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this one, especially because of my relationship with our upcoming speaker. Um, but I do want to mention about uh, the, the Daniel O. Trainer series. He's the namesake of our College of Natural Resources and this building, indeed. Um, he was an internationally regarded uh, specialist in wildlife diseases, an excellent teacher. Um, he was uh, active, very active politically, and he was always a constant ambassador for the College of Natural Resources, as well as the uh, University of uh, Wisconsin Stevens Point. And it's for these reasons and many others that uh, we want to dedicate this seminar series to Dr. Trainer. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the speaker that I have for you today, or that we have for you today, um, is, uh, is one who is also associated with UW Stevens Point, one of our alums, and he actually he was the 2021 outstanding alum of uh, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point College of Natural Resources in, in 2021. Um, Kurt Verkotteren, Dr. Verkotteren, and I go back a little ways, and I have to tell you this story. Um, Kurt, are you there? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> so in 1990, I was a new professor at the University of Wisconsin, or excuse me, at University of Nebraska, Lincoln. And uh, I really wanted to bring on a graduate student and I didn't have any money. And so I needed to compete or actually have a student who could compete for a merit-based scholarship. And I was a graduate student of, of here at Stevens Point as well. And so I, I contacted uh, Dr. Harden, Dr. James Harden, who was the leading professor in the day. And uh, I asked him if he knew of any young guns, anybody who was really energetic and a great GPA and just who would be a fantastic student who would compete for this merit-based scholarship. And without hesitation, <clears throat> he said, Kurt Verkotter. And so then I went on to a, a recruiting uh, job to try and bring Kurt in. He had offers from three other universities to go on to graduate school. And somehow I was able to wrangle Kurt to go to the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. And he worked on a master's degree <clears throat> with me in white-tailed deer. He worked uh, in private industry for a while after that. And then he came back and worked with me on a PhD, also again in white-tailed deer. 
And before he graduated, he had a position waiting for him at the National Wildlife Research Center. That's the research arm of the US Department of Agriculture Division of Wildlife Services. It's based in Fort Collins, uh, Colorado. Now, Kurt had done all of this work on white-tailed deer, but do you think that's what he got to work on? No, his first job was to work on rodent integrated pest management, rodent, rodent IPM. And uh, so he worked for a while on that, but it didn't take too long for the people in Fort Collins to realize that this fellow had a lot of talents, uh, a lot of adaptability. <clears throat> and so they put him on a lot of different projects. Um, and so then I started naming him after those projects. And so he became Goose Boy. He became a deer guy. And then he was ro a rabies man. And now I like to call him Pig Boy because <laughs> he's a national expert in working on wild swine. Uh, so he's bounced around quite widely in, in his career, and uh, he's done exceptionally well. Um, Kurt manages a large staff at the National Wildlife Research Center, including scientists, uh, technicians, students. He works internationally, uh, widely across the globe. He, I think, averages somewhat over 10 refereed publications per year, which is crazy, but uh, he's remarkably talented in this regard, as far as uh, pooling other scientists, working and developing teams and being effective team leader. And because of this, uh, he's been recognized widely, uh, not just here at UW-Stevens Point, but in many other venues. Uh, Kurt was active in the Wildlife Society and still is active in the Wildlife Society. Um, he's, as I mentioned before, he's widely recognized. And uh, it's our privilege to have Kurt on the air he really wanted to be here because he really wanted to come back to Wisconsin to go hunting. So then he could just do this presentation as well. But um, because of some travel restrictions with his agency, he's not able to join us in person. Thus, we have this uh, remote presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Kurt Burkhodron. He's going to be talking about, oh yeah, the title, um, A Pointer's Perspective, 31 Years Post-Graduation. <laughs> Take it away, Kurt. Okay, you know, I'm just sick, you guys. Uh, my internet connection has been great all day and for weeks, and now I'm not sure that it's very good. Uh, you've been cutting in and out. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. You're good. Okay, if I think I'll, Take my video off if, if you give me a signal that I'm cutting out or anything. But if, if, if we're good to go, we're good to go. So I'm glad to hear that. Well, thank you very much for the super kind introduction, Scott. Um, your, your presentation and, is in uh, notes in presentation mode, just to let you know. It's in what mode? It's, it's in presentation in pre mode. Yep. So we're good to go. Uh, no, it, we can see your notes. Your presenter mode. Thank you. That's it. So like huh. it's the one where it's the black screen where we can see you. <laughs> Let me try again here. Sorry guys. It was uh, it was right before. Yeah, I don't know what went wrong here. Well, you know, they say that to err is human, but to really screw things up, you need a computer. All right, you got it. Okay, um, everything was going so well. Also, my internet was going down, so hopefully it sticks with us here um, and I get it on, on track. Uh, and Scott is so right. It is. It just makes me sick to not be able um, to be there. But with um, COVID restrictions for USDA employees right now, um, I wasn't able to down at all. Um, it's just meetings, conferences, seminars like this that I'm not able to, to go to. Um, so that just really bonds me out. But it was about 31 years ago um, that I graduated. Kurt, I'm going to have you turn your video off because it's, it's cutting out. Uh, 
Uh, and and what a special guy, you know, for somebody who's kind of a near re retirement age, he still had a, a twinkle in his eye and a great energy. He was just turned on by sharing. Those days, there's a 35 millimeter slide. Kurt, Kurt I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I'm going to have you. I'm going to have you turn your video off. It's it's cutting out pretty bad. Can you hear me? I can't, but now I got a, the way that I have this going. It's hard to turn my video off. Here. Okay, is this better? I hope. For now, I'll let you know if it gets bad again. Okay, please do. So, um, you, I was able to be taught by. Dr. Trainer, I remember him telling stories about um, hunters telling him that they like the little livers on, on white-tailed deer better than regular liver, and that, those are actually liver flukes. Um, he kind of turned me on to diseases, and over the years, I've done quite a few studies now um, on diseases, because his passion was just contagious. Um, pictures here of doing some work where we're pulling hearts from white-tailed deer for a CBD study. On the right there, we invented a technique to test live deer and elk for CWD with through rectal mu mucosa. It was the most practical live test there for a long time, still used quite extensively. Um, they turned me on to diseases so much. We've got chapters in books about deer diseases. Uh, it's been a big focus of, of my career. Other disease work that we've done, uh, with feral swine, for example, pseudo rabies and swine brucellosis. Um, work on Puerto Rico with with um, mongoose. It's a nesticized uh, mongoose there on the right, where they have rabies and they're giving it to the livestock and, and to the citizens. Um, quite a few studies over the years, and and I attribute a lot of that passion that I got early on in point to being in Dan Trainer's class. I want to talk a little bit about you know who I am to give you some some context because I'm I'm sure that I, you know me 31 years ago was quite a bit like a lot of you um, now and give you a perspective of, of what it took me to get kind of a job that I think I kind of like. And well, you know it was my mom who kind of kicked me in the butt to go to college. I didn't really see it as being in the cards for me um, related to like you know family situation of, you know, divorced parents and not much cash and all that sort of thing. I had a high school teacher, a biology teacher, um, who I think saw that I was really into the biology and he really pushed me to visit point and check it out and consider it. And then we had a speaker from Wisconsin DNR, Tom Boddy, um, come as a local biologist in the Green Bay area. I'm from Ashwaubenon, you guys. And, uh, and his talk just turned me on I, and I, I knew I wanted to go to Stevens Point. And I wanted to be a wildlife biologist. And, you know, here we are 31 years, years later. And Stevens Point and the student chapter of TBS played a big role um, in that all for me. I really, really just love my undergrad days at Point. It was really hard work. I think that's where I really learned to buckle down and get serious about academics. But I was able to um, just get turned on by, by the classes. It kind of ignited a passion in me. And I was also surrounded by so many great classmates, you know, colleagues, as well as the profs at UDSP, where really kind of learned to, to do the work and, and embrace it. As an undergrad, you know, good grades and experiences you guys hear this again and again, I'm sure, I would get you to the next phase, you know, whatever that may be for you. And for me, my leaping off point was really Stevens Point. And I tried to find a picture. You guys, I had a, a bunch of buddies my senior year and like to celebrate, you know, graduating and then all going our own separate ways. We uh, took a class at this little airport in Amro and, and we parachuted, I jumped out of an airplane. So that'd been a perfect, uh, picture for this, but it's long, it's long gone. But Stevens Point was definitely my my jumping off point, you know, and all those great friendships, all those, all those memories. Um, I still really hold dear and stay in touch with a lot of those folks. And I hope that you guys um, do too. 
but ultimately, you know, if you succeed, it all kind of comes from inside of you and what you want, um, what you make of the opportunities and challenges that come, come before you that you kind of create for yourself, right? It kind of depends on how you play the cards that you're dealt, how you play them. And coming out of UWSP with a degree in your pocket, you already have a leg up on other young folks in the field. You know, wildlife truly is a small field, a small profession. Everyone knows everyone. Um, and everyone knows the reputation of UWSP. Everybody knows pointers who are contributors in the field. You'll, you'll see this as you get into it. You guys are really standing on the shoulders of, of giants. Um, a fun exercise to do is consider your wildlife profession family tree. And you guys all go all the way back to the originator. As students of Dr. Hingstrom, this is just one pattern. As students of Dr. Hingstrom, who was a student of Dr. Scott Craven from UW Madison, who was a student of Don Rush, also a Madison, who was a student of Lloyd B. Keith, who was a student of Robert McCabe, who was one of the original graduate students of Aldo Leopold. So your family tree includes the father of wildlife management. How cool is that? And you may have other familial connections um, too. Like for example, I was a TA under Dr. Ray Anderson when I was at UWSP. And Dr. Anderson was a graduate student of Fred and Francis Hammerstrom, who were graduate students of Aldo Leopold. Fran, for example, was the first female wildlife professional who, to get a PhD. Um, and just the fact that you're taking the time to, to listen to me pontificate, um, tells me that you're interested, you're, you're, you're taking advantage of what, you, what UWSP has to offer with the student chapter and all. And that was really a big um, bonus for me, I think. I, I really embraced the state chapter. It's great to be part of the 50th um, year celebration. And some of the things I was involved with that I recall, you know, really, really dearly were the Solid Owl Project. Um, and I saw somewhere recently that that's still, um, still going on. I can't remember Gene's last name, but that was just a great experience. Um, a buddy and I were the first to put the newsletter for the student chapter uh, to have it done on a computer. Before that, it was always, you know, typewritten and we, at that time, digitized it. We, we were able to then print off tons of copies and, and have a nice design and format, produce it on floppy disks. Um, what other activities with TWS was I really into? We tried to start a wildlife rehabilitation program. I did wildlife rehabilitation when I was in high school. The like pictures I showed um, was me with some of the animals that I rehabbed um, as a high schooler. Started the um, Wildlife Rehabilitation Program at, at the Wildlife Sanctuary. It's called Our Paws. I think it's actually still in existence in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, these pictures here, I remember skipping ornithology. I didn't skip many classes, but one time Lauren Ayers and I did skip ornithology on a beautiful spring day, and that's where we found this possum. His name was Virgil. Um, his, his mom When we all went off to grad school and jobs, he ended up at the a small zoo in La Crosse, Wisconsin. The, the picture there with the eagle, um, did, did some volunteer work with Ron Eckstein from Wisconsin. After undergrad days, um, some advice for, for you, you go off to, to make memories, striving, looking for a career where a good portion of the time, you can't really tell if you're working or if you're playing. To me, a career is something that's all encompassing, where a job is part of how you, how you Um, trapping deer, collaring deer, 
uh, nestizing gear with the dart projectors. It, it was really, really good. And as you get into it also, besides the wildlife, you're gonna to learn to really love the people. You're gonna be part of a lot of different teams. Um, you know, you're getting into this for, for kind of heart and, and passion, and I really respect that. Um, you all get jobs in the wildlife field. Um, you may all not get jobs in the wildlife field, which is, which is just fine, but you're all gonna find you know, solid rewarding paths. You're gonna be on teams, working toward goals, playing different roles in those teams, making an impact and having a rewarding life. These are some teams that I'm always oftentimes part of here. Um, lower, lower left is a, a team from a big study that we were doing in Texas related to looking at pig home ranges and evaluating different strategies to group them together and remove invasive um, feral swine. Up, upper right is a team out of the University of Georgia on some grad student studies, learning about movements of, of pigs in relation to densities and methods to, co to control them. Um, you know, team after team, uh, is is a big part of being a wildlife, especially if you're involved in any aspects really of management and research. And uh, like I say, sometimes it's hard to tell if the team you're on, if people you're working with, if you're if you're working or or if you're playing. And I gotta say, liking what you do really does trump you know making a lot of money. Um, it, it all works out. You can make a very very nice living in wildlife and do a lot of things that, that you may not be able to do with just a regular day-to-day -day job. For example, you know, I may never get rich as a wildlife biologist, um, but you might be able to see the world depending on the paths that you take. Well, I'm making a really comfortable living. You know, with, with my job with the National Wildlife Research Center, depending on what I'm, I'm up to, there are oftentimes opportunities to go, you know, other places. It's a National Wildlife Research Center. So I do work all over the, the country, as well as our territories like Puerto Rico and, and Guam, but also other countries, you know, Mexico, Mexico Canada, all over Europe, um, Australia. Picture in the upper left there is some bovine tuberculosis work that I assisted with in the UK, which is really cool. That's a Eurasian badger. And in, in the UK, they're a reservoir for bovine tuberculosis. And I really had fun working with those goofy, you know, almost kind of tame badgers. And I first learned about badgers at UWSP from a professor of mammalogy, Charles E. Long. Um, I, he was towards the end of his career when, when I had him and he wrote the book, Badgers of the World. So it's kind of fun to go and work with different species of badgers after first being um, initiated by, by Charles E. Long. Uh, who was just a really great cantankerous professor. Um, lower, lower right there, that's uh, not just your average feral pig, that's a wild boar in, in Spain. I've done quite a bit of work with um, wild boar in, in Europe. And it's, it's interesting, I, I oftentimes get corrected because in the heat of the moment, when working with um, Europe's wild boar folks, I might call it a a feral hog or a, or a feral pig. And they always correct me and say, no, 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 Dr. Ricardo, this is not just a, a wild hog. This isn't just a feral pig. It's the wild boar, the native wild boar. You know, they're, to them, um, you know, they, they're as, as meaningful and, and special as our deer and elk, right? Other fun adventures um, that, that I've been able to have is going to Europe, France, and um, Switzerland with doing some livestock protection dog work. The livestock protection dogs originated in Europe, and my predecessors brought them to the U.S. to prevent coyotes from killing livestock in the 70s. And and with some of the work that my teams and I have have been doing, um, we're we're bringing the dogs back. To Europe because in Europe where the wolves have been long gone some of the dogs are still there but they haven't been used in years and years so now we're returning that knowledge back to Europe as their wolf populations um, are recovering and they're doing a great job of, of allowing you know those um, 
apex predators to be out in the landscape without having too big of impacts on, on livestock. Uh, picture in the middle there was, uh, that was in, in Spain, an area that was, they call it the palace. And they're proud to show me this, this pristine room and this beautiful kind of mansion of, of a place that they had hosted George Bush before. But I wasn't there to be doing um, debutante kind of things. We were doing bovine tuberculosis um, research where that's, those are red deer there, red deer and, um, and, and wild boar doing bovine tuberculosis work in, in Spain. And it was interesting. You know, with all our bovine TB work in the US, we've got bovine TB, for example, in the northeast corner of the lower peninsula of Michigan. And, and we don't have it near as bad as some of these European countries do. It was, it was Dan Trainer quality um, textbook, picture after picture, um, as we did the necropsies on, on some of these red deer in Spain. Other travel includes you know, on the on the left there is is a Hawaii study site, uh, Australian study site, um, on the right, and through all this travel and, and fun kind of stuff, um, I really kind of value the blue collar wildlifers that that you guys are, you know, the Wisconsinites, Midwesterners, the kind of people who have the attitudes to sort of really dig in and, and suck it up and, and do the work. You know, doing what's right is, is never wrong. Um, the kind of folks that when you're working with them, they're always, you know, they're being kind, they're, they arrive early, they pull their work, they, they help others. Um, those are the folks who really seem to get ahead in this field with good reason and the kind of people that others want to surround themselves with. Um, a comment about uh, working in Australia. Quite often when my team, and I go to Australia, um, they'll, they'll be like, slow down, slow down, you guys. Um, they're saying is Australians work to live and Americans live to work. And there's something to be, to be said about that. I like um, their perspectives of, of slowing down and kind of enjoying More often than not, nowadays, though, I'm vicariously working with my staff, work, working at the desk while my staff is in the field and I'm at the computer, right? Um, doing all that it takes to have them in, in, in the field. But there's been a lot of fun studies, uh, pictures there of building a jab stick when one broke so that we could get the um, chemical mobilant into pigs and traps, blow guns to deliver darts in, into animals. Some strategies, uh, like Scott mentioned, um, I've kind of bounced around a little bit, just taking whatever opportunities the National Wildlife Research Center could, could offer me wherever they needed me. That's really good advice, I think, to be flexible, to be adaptable, to make yourself valuable. Um, I had a party here recently. My first supervisor, Dr. Gary Whitmer, retired early on in COVID, so we had a big retirement party for him here about a month ago. And a long retired assistant director showed up and it was really fun to see him. And, and as he approached me, he said, hey, Kurt, how's the fireman? You know, what are you doing next? Um, getting, uh, being kind of known to be able to be flexible and adaptable, it's really led to my leadership coming to me and giving me great opportunities whenever something new or big kind of needs initiated or something that's struggling needs revitalized. Um, it's been really cool to be able to get those, those opportunities opportunities. I was hired to do rodent research, which took some experiences that Dr. Hingstrom let me gain on the side during my undergraduate or during my graduate years, graduate school years. And before long, because of the networks I had built, because of the um, track record of doing deer research, I was able to kind of compete for grants on deer work and wham, bam, I'm right back doing, doing deer stuff. Um, so it was that experience that really helped lead to one thing after the next and then taking advantage of the opportunities that you're presented 
presented with. Um, so before long, I was right then in a sweet spot of doing work that I really think kind of fits me well, looking at things like, you know, big game, larger mammal damage to crops and how to, how to reduce that damage, um, disease issues like bovine tuberculosis in Michigan, as I mentioned, chronic waste and disease as that became a bigger and bigger issue, um, I was able to fill those niches for my leadership. Some realities to, to ponder, and I want to get into talking about you know what, how I think what's made some of the folks that I've worked with over the years really successful, hoping to give you guys some nuggets as you keep going forward, is everyone has bitches and complaints about their job, right? And you've heard my little spiel about job versus career. Um, you know, what are the complaints? Not enough money, you know, either not enough in your paycheck or not enough to do the job optimally. Too much administrivia. Um, there's always, you know, ups and downs with any job. But I'm telling you, you know, don't be a victim. As you go through your career, if you don't like something that's obviously broken, fix it, you know, change it or change your role or even your job. You know, don't be a sad sack and choose to remain if things aren't aren't um, as good as they could be and if you just can't fix it. There's other opportunities where the, where the grass may be a little bit greener, but, but don't be too harsh either. A lot of times as I um, think about that, a lot of times the grass isn't greener. It's just, you've got to make the situation better for yourself. And although I'm sure you're often told, you know, follow your dreams, follow your passion. You know, the reality is you're not always going to love what you do. You know, every job has aspects of it that aren't the most um, exciting or don't fit you all that well, but it's just part of the job. You gotta suck it up and do it. Another point I'd like to make is really to define success for yourself, you know, not as defined by others, but what's success for you? You gotta find your own way. Outline your own, your own success, kind of your own dreams. Do some soul searching for yourself as you go, right? So don't follow others' paths, but Try not to be pushed by others. A lot of times um, I can see agencies and employers trying to push people into an agenda that may not fit that individual that, that well. And that could be a good way to climb the ladder, but it could be a way to climb the ladder right up and out of the stuff that you really enjoy or, or maybe that you're the best at, at doing. So be sure to keep some control of that yourself because it's, it's you you need to satisfy. And I think that myself, th those who I most envy, who I most respect are, and this is just me personally, but it's like the professors, the researchers, the field managers who were essentially at the same desk their entire careers, but have made big impact. You know, they've, they've made management methods that are, that are being followed, big impacts on policy, you know, developed future wildlifers, you know, the future of the of the profession, you know, others may fit administration, have a passion for that, and that's just great. Um, as you get into your careers, you get a feel for where you fall and, and be sure to be driving your own ship, you know, pay attention to the signals that you send yourself, do your best to drive your own, your own direction, um, which may sometimes mean not taking every single opportunity. Think about what you want, you know, what flavor of job you want and where to find it. You're in control, but realize that that's the jobs, the experiences as you go down kind of lead to the next in the next in the next job. Um, it's where your networks and things come from too. So I, I think in general kind of live for today with an eye for tomorrow. Don't just work hard for the future, but enjoy the process, play along the way, get those valuable experiences. You know, sometimes I feel that I haven't or I don't like enjoy the ride enough. But at other times, like right now for you guys, during an under de undergraduate degree, you really do have to buckle down, you know, master the material, take and create your opportunities. You need to decide, you know, is grad school right for you or not? You know, what are your career goals? Time to be doing some soul searching. More education in general can mean more earning potential, um, more opportunity to lead, depending on where you go, maybe more upward mobility. But if you get into the workforce earlier, you start earning a living um, earlier, depending on what your goals are. 
uh, depends on what option may fit you best. Another option may be, do you go to graduate school right after you get that bachelor's of science? Or do you work for a bit? That too depends on you and what you want to do. If you don't know, then perhaps taking some technician jobs to get some experience would help one decide their best career path and seeing, you know, see where they really think that they want to go, get some more experiences. And I've seen this play out very well for many, many young wildlifers that, that I've employed over the years. And now what I want to do is, is introduce you to a slew of wildlifers that began their careers um, working with me and others on my teams. My point being to relay to you what attributes these specific individuals had that made them valuable to me as a supervisor and a wildlife researcher, and that more importantly, what made them successful in their careers. So not surprisingly, you know, some of these attributes that I talk of, um, some folks will have um, the same kind of similar attributes, right? But I'm gonna mention them because just like a professor making the same point twice, you know, it's gonna be on the test. If I bring up some of these same traits multiple times, you'll know that it's something that those who are hiring wildlifers need and want in, in employees. You know, I don't hire many permanents, just don't have you know, the kind of funds to, to have just too many permanents. So for me as a researcher, I'm, I, I'm most interested in folks who are mature enough to know that they want a master's degree to achieve their career goals, but know that you know, a stint with me can help get them to that, to that master's degree that they want. But it's not, you know, if, if they come to me saying, oh, I'll work for you forever, that's not as, as appealing to me as somebody who knows that they want that master's degree. Um, and then we kind of have a handshake deal. Essentially, you bust your butt for me and I'll bust my butt for you. And it always works out um, by getting their name on a few publications, um, expanding their networks, folks can get on to good programs. So I'll mention a lot of these attributes shared by successful people who have been working with me. You know, and some of these characteristics you guys are just born with, um, others you have to work hard to acquire, but you can acquire them all. I'll start with this guy, this is Jason. Jason was the first graduate student um, that I had, and this was with Dr. Hingstrom. Um, he was University of Nebraska, I was National Wildlife Research Center. And just like Scott went to Dr. Um, James Harden when he was looking for, for a grad student, when he, when he picked me up, that's, we, we asked Dr. Harden at that time for somebody who could fit in to take an over on some of the deer work that I had done for my master's and PhD. And he pointed us to Jason here. And Jason is just the consummate, you know, Charlie Barron stereotype, Midwestern, um, Wisconsin, Minnesota kind of guy. Very respectful, very coachable, just an awesome Midwestern work ethic. Just by growing up, he learned a, a lot of um, the skills needed to be able to function in the field, willing to do what it takes to get to get the job done. Um, Jason here is helping with one of those livestock protection dog studies um, that we did. This one was one retraining these dogs from trying to keep predators from killing livestock. We retooled them um, and we invented essentially a new kind of dog called bovine TB dogs. And these dogs are now used to keep potentially bovine TB infected deer from coming in contact with livestock, livestock feed, and even in entire um, pastures. So as I introduce these guys, I'll tell you about, about some of these studies along the way too, so you can get kind of a feel for what it's like to be a researcher with the National Life Research Center. That was the guy right in the middle there, that's Justin. Um, Justin and I have been working together for well over 30 years actually. He needed, uh, some, in, some credits, so he did an internship um, with me when he was an undergrad and I was working on my master's or PhD, I forget which, but eventually then he followed me out to Fort Collins and, and software, GPS, G, GIS. He's my, dro my drone, um, UAS guy. Um, He's creating all of our apps. We collect all of our data in the field through apps now. And at the same time, he's also always rolled up his sleeves to do whatever's needed in the field. And he's been involved in, in 
you know, field studies all over the country with me. The person there on the far right, that's Mike. Mike has every positive trait that I could really come up with. He came to me after a BS at the University of, of Nebraska, and, and I never let him leave. He and, he and Justin both are permanents with, with me. Um, his drive, his ability to work harder than most and take pride in figuring out any kind of challenge we have in the field um, and just getting the job done. Uh, Mike has is, is got a really high degree of ingenuity. He's kind of a tinkerer, a thinker, an inventor. inventor. He's invented a lot of things that are used in wildlife management and for us trapping animals, nestizing animals, getting collars on animals um, that are really all Mike. Just a really, really valuable, self-reliant, um, accountable right hand. Uh, I don't know where I'd be without this guy. One skill that Mike learned early on that I see in technicians that some kind of have it and some it takes longer is knowing when to make a decision on their own and knowing when to when to ask, you know, that you don't want to bother your, your supervisor too much with, with every little thing. But at the same rate, if, if you make a decision that maybe isn't what the supervisor would have done, it might be the wrong one, right? Um, that's something that that um, you kind of learn along the way. And some people just kind of have it um, through their experiences or learn it faster than others. Something to really be thinking about is that, is that point. Um, another one would be integrity. Like this guy, Mike, um, if you don't got your integrity, you know, that's, that's one of the most important characteristics. It creates your character, it kind of defines who you are. It's all you have is a, is a researcher. Um, and those are the kind of skills that people like me really, really look for in employees. This is Justin and Holly. Um, they were a package deal. I was doing some work in Northeastern Michigan where I needed some folks who had some experience with carnivores. I was doing some coyote work, working with coyotes, skunks, possums, and raccoons. And here they're removing a tooth from an, an anesthetized raccoon for aging. And um, these two came to me from the university from, from Utah State um, where they had done some carnivore work. And I don't remember if I hired Holly and Justin came along or if I hired Justin and, and Holly came along, but they were, a pack, they were a package deal. And these two lived really remotely for me in Michigan, just very, very committed to the work, had a real passion, a real growth mindset, um, always curious and kind of striving to do more and more with the simple kind of tasks that I had them doing to really maximize the efforts. They're just fantastic. Um, and I always appreciate their curiosity. For example, I like to give my techs some fun opportunities, like. Let them, for example, once a year, pick a training you, you want to go to, and we'll send you to that training. And these two went to um, a forensic training because sometimes we are trying dead animals. We want to know like what killed them or how long have they been dead. And so, so them going to that forensic training to learn like what kind of bugs surface at what stage of death was really really impactful and helped us do a good job on on those studies. And it was all their own initiative. This is Matt. Um, he's working with me here on a study with where we wanted to invent methods to um, detect bovine tuberculosis. And of course, we're wildlife guys, but you can't get your hands on wildlife with bovine tuberculosis, tuberculosis very easily. So we went to some farms, some cattle farms that had um, cows with bovine TB. And here we're first inventing a device that measures VOCs, volatile organic um, co compounds to test for um, bovine tuberculosis and it worked. And Matt's the kind of guy who was just very personable, pleasurable to be around, just always a confident, competent guy. Been a lot of work with him over the years with, with big stuff, you know, bison, cows, bighorn sheep, and just the right kind of person to be in that position. This is Stacy. Um, Stacy came to me from the University of Arkansas clear that she wanted to get some research experience. She wanted to, to be part of some studies, get her name on some publications before going off to a master's. And she thought maybe a PhD. And at the end of the day, she did just, just that. After working with me, she got her master's um, in University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then she went off to University of Minnesota where she's now a professor. She had very clear cut goals. She kind of had a blueprint for her career and she just followed it. Um, her step with me was a stepping stone and have it no other way. 
Here in the front of this slide, you got um, Pauline and John. Both of these individuals are just, were very adaptable, kind of solution focused people, very, very ma mature, um, curious and flexible, open to possibilities, the kind of minds that really advance science. John's a microbiologist and his specialty was reproductive inhibition. And, and with me, he worked on a vaccine, a vaccine for chronic wasting disease. And what we have here is an anesthetized deer where Pauline, who's a wildlife veterinarian, is doing a tonsil biopsy. So John's keeping the mouth open while Pauline's going in for a little snip of tonsil to test for, for prions for chronic wasting disease. In the background there, that's Tara. Tara started with me as a work study student for, out of Colorado State University. She wanted to be a wildlife vet. Um, and it takes some years sometimes to get into those programs. So in that interim, uh, she was my head animal care person. She raised, I don't know how many fawns, but like three or four years worth of fawns for me for white-tailed deer studies, took care of a bunch of elk that, that I had over the years, um, just found her niche. And that's what she's doing now. She's raising babies of her own. Greg, Greg came to me kind of as a second career. He was a wood scientist of some sort. He went back for a PhD in, in wildlife. Um, and here's a, here's a tip for you. When I called his reference, Bill Aldridge, who's a very well-respected, now retired professor from Colorado State University. Um, Dr. Aldridge, I'm looking at uh, Greg Phillips' resume here, thinking about hiring him, how you think he'd fit in my job. And what Dr. Aldridge said was, you'd be an idiot if you didn't hire him. Um, that's the kind of reference you're looking for. You know, get to know your professors, uh, get, get their respect, and it will pay you back very well. That's Mike on the right, and, and back behind him there is, is Todd. And I already told you about Mike. Todd came, came to me, and he was very, the characteristic I like about Todd was his authenticity. He was really true to his calling. And he wanted to work with you know, what we call charismatic megafauna. He got a master's at Purdue on coyotes and a PhD in um, working on wolves out of, out of Montana. And I didn't have that kind of work to offer him, but I had some great data sets that he wanted to analyze. And it led to, to a permanent job with us at the National Art Research Center doing some business work. And he had a real good self-awareness um, to know that that wasn't quite what he wanted. He wanted to do sexier animals that, that potentially could have some bigger impact that in, in his mind, you know? Uh, and so now he's a polar bear biologist for the, the USGS. And I always respected Todd for like following that ultimate goal. He got right where he wanted to be. He had a real um, humble self-awareness I kind of mentioned where he just let his work speak for itself. You know, he recognized his strengths, his talents, his skills. He set himself up to put his best foot forward and it took him right where he wanted to go. Here's a young guy, Patrick, who started with me um, during, as a, as a work study, again, out of Colorado State University. So then when he graduated, um, his goal was to be working for a state. He wanted to be a, a field biologist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife or Wyoming Game, Game and Fish. Um, but he was game to dabble with some research stuff, um, working with me until he could find, get the resume that he needed for those jobs. And uh, this kid could hunt, growing up out west. So pictures here, we were doing some work up in Rocky Mountain National Park at high elevations, where we were darting um, adult elk to put collars on them to learn about their movements and interactions related to CWD transmission and movement across the continental divide. And uh, this kid was putting some really tough environmental conditions with, with this study. And he always had just a great willpower, um, great perseverance, strengths to, to see things through. You know, he didn't procrastinate, he got the jobs done and did a really good job of, of making it happen. And, and that really paid dividends for him. And now he has happily um, been employed with Wyoming Game and Fish in a job that he just loves for several years. Here's Tracy. Um, Tracy's got, I don't know how many degrees Tracy's got, but she's kind of searching for a niche for herself. And she got one of the first PhDs on prions, the causative agent of, of chronic wasting disease. And so right out of her PhD, I hired her and she worked for me for, for several years where the way that I'd introduced Tracy was that Tracy does everything from the deer in. 
I gave everything to Madeira. She took care of all of our micro stuff, all of our all of our tissue sampling, all of our our testing, and she's had a real kind of a growth mindset, a passion for figuring out um, new techniques for something that was new, right? A prion, a, a new causative agent of of diseases, and so you know. She took some risks and was recognized opportunities, pursued them, and it's really paid off. You know, she's a world leader in all things CDBD, and, and she's working with USDA Veterinary Services leading CDBD programs. This young man was really quite the, the full package. This is Trevor. Um, Trevor started with me um, coming from Scott as an undergrad at, at UW. Um, at University of Nebraska Lincoln, sorry, and and I hired him for field work. I needed a tough guy who could who could handle um, a really hot summer down near Kingsville, Texas, doing some pig fencing work. We we're evaluating different fences for keeping pigs contained in a disease kind of situation. And Trevor was perfect for that for that job, but he also was a a deep thinker. Um, and. And I realized with time, he just really had a passion for data. And so he stayed on University of Nebraska for a master's, heavy in stats, and then came out to Colorado State University here where, where he really got into statistical analysis and things. And geez, you guys, now he's a professor at Kansas State University. He just had a book come out on Bayesian statistical analysis of, of data. And, and I would have, offered him a job to stay doing field work with me, but he knew that that's not what he wanted for the long term. He, he was a, a stats geek and he's right where he needs to be, right where he wants to be. This is uh, Christy. She was one of my first graduate students to do wild pig work. Um, here we're tracking some, some collared pigs in, e in East Texas. Christy had a lot of initiative to really maximize any opportunity and any data, you know, any data that we collected, she would accomplish my goals with it and then figure out other ways to publish more, learn more from, the, from those data. Um, by doing so, she really built a good track record. She was a crazy good networker with, with good people skills. Um, so I could put her in any situation and she would succeed to the point that after her master's, which she got at Texas A&M Kingsville, we brought her up to CSU, Colorado State University, where she got her PhD, doing some CBD work with me. And now she's managing a reserve on the coast of California. Um, just every time I talk to her, she's just smiling ear to ear, very happy with how things worked out for her. This is Greg. Um, well, I see that from the four wheeler he's sitting on there with, with those pigs with, with paintball splotches on them. That was a study we were doing where we were pressuring pigs, to, um, evaluating their ability to breach different fence designs, which is kind of a disease preparedness study. And uh, we did this study probably 15 years ago, but I'm sure I'm glad we did, because now if you're paying attention to the news at all, the African swine fever um, in the Dominican Republic, you know, just one step away from Puerto Rico, one step away from Florida, uh, that study is gonna come in pretty handy. But, but Greg, this is a guy who knew what he wanted from an early age. You know, when I first, actually I met his dad first. His dad was a real active bull hunter in an area that um, I was doing research. And, and at that time, Greg was just a little kid, but he was into big bucks. He was into bow hunting and he was into videoing deer. Dr. Hingstrom brought him on for a master's degree. We worked with Greg to, to make a master's that fit him really well. Elastic extension components. We could use his video and cinematography skills. And, um, he found, he created himself a heck of a niche. He's one of the founders of the hunting public. If you're familiar with that um, YouTube series, where these guys uh, teach people how to have success hunting on public lands. This is Bethany. Bethany is a good example of uh, a person who he kind of took a shine to after working with her. She was working on a military base, doing some wildlife work that we were working on. Um, she enjoyed working with us and, and was learning a lot. I offered a master's degree down in Texas A&M Kingsville. She saw it advertised, um, applied, got the job and pulled off a few really nice studies for us where what made her so valuable is that she could get us on ground with crusty old farmers because she's just a personable, likable person. Um, 
And she's also made herself valuable by taking the initiative to do a lot of the drone work that we've been doing here over the years recently. And now that that niche is just important to us. So um, we're keeping her on for the next and the next and the next study. Here we have Dr. Chris Ellis. Um, I inherited Chris when I took over some rabies work. She was a GS5, which is an entry level, bachelor's of science level technician as a wildlife vet. And I thought, what's this person doing as a wildlife vet doing this kind of lower level job? What she was doing is she just had a real passion for being in the field. She wanted real wildlife work. And that's where um, the, the opening that she could get. And she just proved herself time after time after time. So that by the time that um, uh, most recently, she's, she's a higher level um, person with, within USDA. She's worked with me on several studies over the years to the point that she's now with USDA Veterinary Services doing a lot of wildlife vetty kind of stuff. And every time that I need somebody in the field to help me out with, uh, with a wild pig study, like in this picture here, which is uh, a crop damage study in Texas where we're collaring a bunch of pigs, Chris is there for me. She, she takes the opportunity to get in the field and to help us out in the field. This is Carl. Carl um, is really the full package, very adaptable, flexible, solution-focused guy that really had a plan for himself and high aspirations. Um, here he's working with me in, in, this is by you guys, this is by Sandhill, um, the Sandhill Wildlife Management Area there in Wisconsin. We did a study to evaluate how high a fences deer could jump related to keeping captive deer on the right side of the fence and keeping wild deer outside of um, captive deer fences and chronic wasting disease. Um, and Carl had some ideas. So he helped me with that study. He also had some ideas of his own for example, we, we, I say we, but he invented a contra contraceptive device for white-tailed deer and, and it worked. Um, and so that was his master's degree by the University of Wisconsin-Madison. This is um, David. David came to me as a, as a postdoc. And here's a guy who, who knew he wanted to be at a really high level wildlife school as an, as an academic. Um, he wanted to come and work for my, myself and Dr. Hingstrom because of all the data sets that we had that he knew he could just publish a lot of papers very efficiently and that's the niche we're looking for. We need somebody who is competent, somebody who is efficient with, with data. And so it makes for a real win-win relationship when you got somebody like that. So um, he helped us make more of our publications than we had the abilities and skills to do. And he just took his time for the cherry job to open up. And now he's with the um, Penn State Cooperative Unit, been there for several years. He's got his dream job, worked out just, just right. And um, the relationship with, with me and the work they did for us was just great to the point that now I run graduate students with him, of course. This is Joe. Um, Joe worked with me for several years after being on some temporary jobs with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. His goal was to get in with Colorado Parks and Wildlife as a, as a permanent kind of a field biologist. But sometimes, you know, it takes a while for those jobs to, to pop up. And, and so he took a job with me where I was able to give him permanent work for several years. And man, he was just a consummate naturalist, biologist, very respectful um, person, very approachable, very authentic person. Um, we all knew his goal was to get back with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, but as he worked with me, um, well, I couldn't respect him more. I take a bullet for this guy, very self-reliant, took on a lot of responsibility, always very accountable. If, if I had to hand a job off to Joe, I knew it was going to be done right. Uh, just all the kind of um, attributes that an employer is looking for in a good, solid field guy. This is Nate. The story with Nate is he got, let me see, Nate got his bachelor's at um, Central Michigan. After Central Michigan, um, he got a master's at Colorado State University, worked with us a little bit at the NWRC, knew he needed a PhD to get where he wanted to get, which is he wanted a job like mine, to be a researcher at NWRC. Went to Michigan State for that. As soon as he was done, I hired him. I had some opportunity and brought him, brought him right back. So now Nate um, works with me at the National Art Research Center 
as a um, research grade scientist. And the best trait about Native I'm say is his integrity. Some of the work that we're doing, we're inventing toxicants for feral swine, you know, not the most glamorous job, you know, rat poison for pigs, right? Um, it's very important work we're under a lot of, of um, pressure kind of politically and from all kinds of different angles. Um, with this work, we're killing animals. So it's not, you know, maybe the most, the work to be the most proud of in, in some ways, but they are invasive species, of course. But I just love Nate's integrity, you know, steadfastly, step by step, going through the research process, um, allowing the results to guide us and to not, and to not be pushed. Um, all of his hard fought knowledge from these studies is what's driving our research. And I really appreciate Nate's backbone in this. Just a great, great colleague. This is Michael. Um, picture there on the left. Michael's first job with me was in southwestern Colorado doing some, some evaluation of fences to keep deer and elk from damaging crops. He did such a good job. We shipped him off to, to Michigan where he worked on bovine tuberculosis and pigs for a long time. I'm sorry, bovine tuberculosis and deer. Um, he knew that, that to get the kind of job he really wanted um, with me or wherever else, he had to go off for a master's degree. So he sent him to Auburn, got his master's there. The day he graduated, I called and asked if he wanted a job for, for a present for a graduation gift. He said, yeah, he's worked with me ever since. Um, lower right picture there, he's, he's putting a bait in, putting toxic bait in pig specific bait stations that, that we invented. Michael's one of my primary guys on all things feral swine that we're doing. And his attributes just, just he happily, you know, has a, a crazy drive and work ethic. He'll happily work me into the ground without even realizing it. You know, he takes pride in completing challenging tasks, takes the lead when needed. This guy is always very optimistic, respectful, always prepared, just a pleasure to work with and always gets the job done well. Here we've got Jared. Jared is another guy from Central Michigan. Um, and why I'm getting these guys from Central Michigan, guys, you guys, it just dawned on me is because Tom Gehring, who's a professor at Central Michigan, he and I were classmates at Point together. So he's one of my connections I kind of go to when I need good people for jobs. Um, Jared, when I was undergrad, was just oozing with energy, um, a real doer, happy to do whatever job needed done. Uh, here he's He's in the little cart that he made with uh, one of our last livestock protection dogs in it. After we did a lot of experience with these dog, experiments with these dogs, we gave them to landowners. And um, Jared made these pens for these dogs so that the landowners could easily um, take their shelter from pasture to pasture as they rotated their cattle. And it gave the dogs a place where they could kind of be alone away from, um, away from the cattle and their food was protected. Um, Jared did just a great job. One of his jobs with me, you guys, was it was his job to wear this deer suit, put this deer hide over him, and approach the dogs from different angles. Well, I collected data to see how the dogs reacted, if they're going to do a good job of keeping real deer away. Um, awesome guy. Went on for a master's, went on for his PhD. He's now the chief of wildlife for the Michigan DNR. And the last person I want to tell you guys about is, is Eric. Um, I saved a pointer for last. Um, he, he came to me as a starry-eyed young guy uh, after working with Dick Thiel there in Wisconsin, wanting to do wolf research. And he knew he wanted to get a, some research experience to get to be a wolf researcher. He was gonna need a master's, just wanted to help us out on some work to help him get to his next step. And Eric was like the micro of wildlife, right? You know, we, we gave him all the dirty jobs and he did them all happily, which is where you start with a bachelor's of science degree, right? Um, he was involved with several studies with us. Um, some of the species he worked on, like the big old wild pig there, may not be as glamorous as wolves, but the research met methods are the same. And, and he did get to do some pretty glamorous stuff. I took him to Australia. There he is with a, a joey kangaroo. That was part of a little study that, that we were doing. And there's a picture there of, of Dr. Hinkshire and myself and, and Eric from an elk hunt this past year, where Eric now has landed a nice job with, you know, your goals change as you, as you mature. And his dream job now um, is what he's got, being a terrestrial biologist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife up in the same area that uh, Scott and I hunt elk and where we had Eric um, hunting elk. And with that, I just wanna give you guys some kind of final pontifications here, strategies to help you succeed 
you know, if some of these attributes don't maybe necessarily come naturally, you can learn it. You can be coachable. Um, never get defensive. You guys have a thick skin, especially if you're getting into research, you have to have a, a thick skin. Always be sure to kind of do the work, um, perform well, make yourself valuable. Do whatever it takes to have a fantastic attitude. People like to be around people with a good, optimistic attitude. Make sure you've got one. Um, have confidence in yourself. You're learning the skills. Be confident about it. Listen, uh, without judgment, when someone's trying to communicate, I've learned that I've got to shut the heck up sometimes and stay silent and listen, absorb it, and that's where I learn the most. Keep on working on your own personal track record. Create good references. Create a resume for yourself. You know, get serious about determining what you want, what it's going to take um, experience-wise, and, and it'll come. Opportunities will come your way. I guarantee it. Surround yourself with fulfilled, fulfilled um, successful people. I show a picture there of, 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 of my wife and I. You know, met her in, in graduate school. If I want to surround you know, myself shoulder to shoulder with somebody as, as competent and intelligent as her, I don't know what have went as far as I kind of have, you know, um, surround yourself with, with good people. Upper, upper left-hand corner there, I, I couldn't afford a technician when I was working for, for Dr. Hingstrom, so I, so I bought myself a best friend, and that, that's Buck. Um, he's a dog I had back, at, back in those days. Um, I always appreciated his always over the top optimistic attitude, you know? Other points would be, as you're thinking about potential employers, you know, you've just had some great exposures to this seminar series as I look, you know, Dr. Anderson talking with you guys, Dr. DeBay, so an academic perspective. You've had Tammy Ryan from the DNR. Uh, looking back, I see you had Jim Heffelfinger give a talk last spring. Some of you guys are probably in that talk. So there's another guy from the state agency. He, by the way, is my second cousin. Um, and I'll tell you some of my own thoughts and observations about um, the different job kind of options that are out there for you. Now that you've had somebody like me here from a federal agency, as you think about federal agencies and state agencies, both are big bureaucracies, right? You know, the federal could be likely worse for the bureaucracy type aspects of it. Um, and it fits some people, it may not fit others as, as well. There's no one size fits all. Like being a Fed, occasionally we'll have a disconnect between leadership in DC and in the field. There's tons of examples of that. You know, sometimes politics can affect decisions when, damn it, I want science to be driving the, the decisions, but you've got to be able to, to accept that if you're going to be a federal biologist. Some pros of being a Fed, I think there's probably pretty good upward mobility. Um, you've, especially if you're willing to, to move around some, you know, if you move around throughout your career, um, you can do really well in, in federal agencies. State agencies um, in some states are better funded than others. Um, you may not travel as broadly, but you may travel quite a bit within a, a certain state, which could be really great. Thinking about private entities to, to work for. Um, they, in a private entity, of course, you need to generate business. Could be a good living. Um, gotta be conscious of job security, and the track record of the outfit. And sometimes they have less upper mobility in, in private entities. Nonprofits, my wife, for example, she runs a nonprofit. Um, then you're thinking about continually bringing in grants. You have to bring in contracts. Maybe you're getting some funding through donors. So you know, if you got the right degree of passion, um, the, the nonprofits are a lot of times very, very comfortable, great jobs too. Um, so as a whole, though, you guys are really setting yourselves up right. You know, you're working toward degrees from UWSP. You're engaged in your student chapter. You're listening to old guys like me, who, you know, who are really looking for the next generation of wildlifers to hand the baton to. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, I hope I didn't go long. I hope I came through. Uh, I'd be happy to stick around and answer any questions that you guys may have.
Well, I can't hear Jennifer. I hope I hope you guys can hear me through all that. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Oh, for crying out loud. Okay, so apparently can't handle a simple microphone. All right, so uh, I'm gonna, does anybody in the audience have any questions here? There's nothing in the chat right now. So it's okay. <laughs> oh, Scott Hangstrom's got a question. You'll have to relay the questions for me, Jennifer. Yeah, so I, hold on. <laughs> hey, Kurt, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so I had fun seeing all those old photos of uh, fellow colleagues and uh, all of the attributes that you expressed of them, and I agree wholeheartedly. I'm curious, you've been a supervisor for a while now, and I suspect you've probably had a few duds Okay, um, if you were to characterize some of those duds that didn't quite work out so well, I'm kind of asking for the flip side. What should you not do <laughs> if you want a job in wildlife? Wow, Scott, it's, it's crazy that you asked me that question today because I just terminated somebody yesterday. Um, I've had a person who started working for me um, as a work study. And this person's job was just looking at camera trap images, which is a, you know, we use camera traps for everything. And actually our teams were the first to use them for, for science, like where you got enough images to do statistical comparisons and things for real research. So it's always been a big part of what we do. And, and uh, this person started as a, as a work study and then they've been permanent with me for the last three years. And, um, Part of what we do is, is we do some, some double observer checking of images to make sure everyone's doing a good job. And I had a new person start this summer. So I ramped up my, my checking to make sure that the new person was clicking and was understanding it all. And she was taught a lot by this other person actually. Um, and in, my, in our checks, which is just part of the job, you know, of course, there were a lot of errors, more errors from this established, very competent person than, than there should have been. So, so I met with them and um, laid out the, the issues, asked where are the issues, and, and there was no good comeback, Scott. It was, it was like, well, you know, and as feds right now, as you can see, I'm in my garage, um, we're all home, and you can't look over somebody's shoulder, so you're trusting that they're doing a good job. And, and I think she just got bored with that duty and kind of lazy. And I mentioned integrity a lot. You know, this person that I've been signing her timesheet all the time. Uh, and there was no good excuse or, or reasoning for it. Um, we had the tough conversation. I wasn't convinced that things were going to change. So I am not going to renew their appointment. Um, ouch, it's so funny that you, that you bring that one up. But that's a big one. As a researcher, integrity, you know, data quality, doing the job as laid out in the protocol, you know, following that instruction, those are super important to me. And not everybody's got that. You know, not everyone's got that um, desire to, you know, go the extra mile in uncomfortable conditions because, oh, we also need to, you know, take this measurement and, and it's not comfortable right now or whatever. So those sorts of things are, are what gets people thinking, having me thank them right out the door. Doesn't mean they might not fit in some other job, but as a, as a researcher, strict adherence to protocols, being trustworthy, um, letting you know right away when there's issues so that's not too late, like, so that you can't um, come back from it are all super important to me. Any other questions at all? If there's anybody out there on Zoom, if you've got questions, 
Oh, okay, it's got a question here. For those of us being retired now, there's an opportunity with the citizen scientist survey. This is what somebody who chimed in on the on the chat. Whoopsie. Oh, for crying out loud. Um, if there's yeah, if there's any other questions or comments in the chat, feel free to put them in the in the chat. Otherwise, anybody else here have any questions? Okay, I think that's I think we are about to, about to wrap it up. So, um, so Kurt, I'd like to thank you again for for being with us, and um, we hope to have you back sometime. And I think that's that's about it. So well, I apologize for being remote, and I see that I also went a little long. I apologize for that too. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I really appreciate it. You know, UWSP, the, the student chapter. It means a lot to me, and it's just great to have had the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very.